Hey everybody, welcome to the Kingdom Project Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Hall, and we will be continuing our study in uh, Galatians today, in chapter 4. We'll be looking at uh, verses 21 through 31, and I uh, hope you all are well. Uh, thanks for streaming, downloading, tuning in, and all that good stuff. So, uh, just a uh, quick note before we start here that time of year again where I ask my listeners if if uh, they feel like they want to help in any way to uh, to donate some money to the podcast so we can stay on for another year and uh, the link for that is in the description all right so it's just a PayPal me uh, you can dollar ten dollars doesn't matter helps to go pay for the hosting for uh, an entire year for not just the sermons but all the uh, episodes that I do in between the sermons and so if you've been following following along with um, the weekly releases uh, you've noticed we were doing a crash course through the Bible and uh, we had just ended with the judges kingdoms and the exile eras so we will be getting into the return and the silence era, and then going over uh, some poetry and prophetical literature after that this coming week. All right, so look forward to that if you're following along, and I hope it's helping you. And uh, yeah, so let's get into this. This is the allegorical argument from Paul, all right, and uh, we will explain that here momentarily. A uh, quick note on this. I have done podcast episodes on this section of Galatians, and I've also done sermons on this section of Galatians as well. Um, like ca- cast out the slave woman or cast out the bond woman with the, the titles of those. So it's a, uh, you know, a comparison that, that in a contrast that's been going on that Paula has been laying out like mosaic law to the new co- you know mosaic old covenant to the new covenant and all that so um and he says it's uh allegory however he's going to well well I'll just get to it I just wanted to point it point out that I, we have gone over this there's probably about four episodes I think there's uh three or four episodes that I've done on this section already so anyway, so the, it could be a lot of repetition, but if you've not heard it, good. When we ended, we ended last week uh, stating that in these following verses, Paul would be leaving behind his personal appeal to those in Galatia. So going forward, he, he's re- returning to make the case from Scripture about why it's foolish to want to be under the law of Moses instead of depending on faith in Christ, okay? So, uh, in verse 7 of chapter 3, Paul said, So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So, uh, in our text today, Paul, in effect, says, Okay, you know, Abraham was your father, but let's look at the mother as well. Who's your mom? Who's your mom? Who's your mama? So, uh... (laughs) <laughs> that's pretty much what he's saying. So uh, let's uh, let's just look at the first few verses here. Let me pull it up. If you hear the noise in the background, that's the heat. It's cold. We woke up to a, just a little bit of snow. Nothing to really talk about there, but uh, had a little bit. So in this, in your Bible, the heading could be an ex- uh, could say an example of Hagar and say Sarah. Okay, so he says, "Tell me, you who desire to be under the law." Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. All right, present Jerusalem was then in the first century, for she is in slavery with her children. 
But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at the time, sorry, but just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Now, that's the full text. All right. So, if you, you may remember um, a lot of things from this section. All right. It's in one of those instances, though, uh, where I just sort of dropped you guys in and did my best to explain this. All right. Now we have the full flavor of context since we've been going through all of Galatians, though, and everything has been laid out. Okay, so Paul's form of argument is very Jewish. Okay, it's rabbinical, which means that his first century readers, they had no issues or problems following him here. Okay, but that same style can seem rather difficult to us because we are the first century readers. All right. So tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Paul is arguing with those who want to go back to Judaism and also, though, take Jesus with them. He's addressing people who want a hybrid religion that is part Jewish, part Christian. They intend to believe in Jesus, plus they want to live under the law as a means of pleasing, all right? Uh, Pleasing God and winning his favor. So everything in the in this passage is aimed at those who are confused, confused believers who were being tempted to go back to the law of Moses. And his point is, have you considered the implications of what you're about to do? All right. So everyone had been toying with the law for far too long because of the false teachers had been uh, pursued persuasive enough to convince them to do so so their arguments had to make sense and so since they made sense they were also convincing they held strongly to being the sons of abraham so it was easy easy for them to come in and say we are the jews we are the chosen people of god because our father is abraham all right and because of that sign of the covenant people um uh, the is the, the, sorry. I, I, because of that, the sign of the covenant people is the sign of circumcision. Okay, so here's the deal: if you, you guys, you Gentiles, really want in on this, then if you really want to be a part of the people of God, you're going to have to submit yourselves to circumcision and keep the law. All right. So the Galatians wanting to do what was right. And being conflicted by all this, they wanted to be right with God 100%. So, they're moving toward the law now. All right, so, and we've seen throughout the letter that Paul is challenging them, all right, challenging his readers who claim to have, uh, to value the law so highly uh, to consider what it it taught. And he's drawn from Genesis, which is is a book in the in the law section of the old testament so he used the term law to refer to two different things in this verse the mosaic law and the old testament now obviously paul feels that he hasn't made his point uh full enough yet or or maybe he did but he wants to take uh make the argument even stronger Okay, so he approaches the matter with another illustration from the Old Testament again, when he says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born brought 
uh, or born through promise, okay? So we know Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And the birth of these two children provides Paul with this material for a, a sermon, if you will, that needed that was needed to teach the biblical lesson for those there in Galatia, as well as many of us today, since many still believe Israel and or the Jews are God's chosen people still. Um, it, they're not like it, it's the, from it, it was types and shadows like. You're, you're a Jew if you're a Christian. All right? Israel is the church. And it's not replacement theology. Okay, so I won't get into that. But <laughs> but this is, it, it's really important. And it's very critical today. Especially because of dispensational theology that's in the church. And dispensational theology says that uh, Israel and the church are separate. They're two separate things, and so the church is plan B, and so at some point, uh, the the fullness of the Galatians, uh, you know, or the world uh, of the church will, not Galatians, the, the church will come in and then be raptured off the earth, and then all attention, uh, God's attention will go to Israel. And it's not in the Bible. It's not biblical. It was a, a made-up theology that comes from the late 1800s, so it's not that old at all. All right, so all all of the details of this argument is in Genesis. We've been over some of that already, but God compared uh, or God appeared to Abraham, told him to take his wife Sarah, leave that land, go to a land that he would show him later, and he promised to give him descendants who would become a great nation, and that's in Genesis 12. Now Abraham was uh, 76 years old, Sarah was 65, they had no children. And when they arrived in Canaan, the, the land that God had promised them, okay, uh, God repeated that promise, saying, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. And this is Gen Genesis thirteen sixteen. So 10 years go by, and there's no child. So Sarah suggests that Abraham uh, take the Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, in Genesis 16 and Hagar becomes pregnant and a son was born and they named him Ishmael all right so obviously Sarah wanted a child and came to her her human conclusion that she was too old to conceive so she took that matter into her own hands right now we know we don't need to we don't need to try to help God out okay so <laughs> uh, when we do things go wrong that's what's going on here, all right? There's this animosity arose between the two women. Ishmael is stuck in the middle of this. 14 years go by. Abraham's now 99. Sarah's 80, 89. And God appears to Abraham uh, to say his wife will be blessed by him because he was going to give Abraham a son by her. And God would bless her, and she would be a mother of nations and kings of people shall come from her. Now, that's important that God says that she will be a mother of nations. We always hear about Father Abraham, but we don't hear much about Mother Sarah. OK, so to be clear here, Ishmael was not the son of promise because God said, my covenant, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you. At, the, at this season next year in Genesis seventeen twenty one, And then Isaac was born. He was the son of promise. And this is why Paul used this example. The Jews revered uh, Abraham as their spiritual father. Right? As far as they were concerned, if you were a physical descendant of Abraham, then you were in good standing with God. As long as you could find Abraham somewhere in your family tree, then you, you didn't really need to do anything else. You didn't need anything else. It was a matter of lineage or, or heritage. So if you could find that, you're in God's family. But Paul is saying, no, sorry, that's not the case. God's family is made up of those who have a relationship with him by faith in Jesus. So it's a, it's a matter of faith not your family tree or your bloodline, okay? 
So Paul is saying that Ishmael was born according to the flesh as meaning from human efforts apart from God. And he, he was born according to a lack of faith on, on Abraham and Sarah's part as they tried to accomplish God's will by doing their own will. On the other, while the other son, Isaac, wasn't born uh, in that way, according to the flesh, okay, in the sense that, or in contrast, he was born according to a promise given to them by God. So what makes his birth different is that God had intervened, all right, instead of Sarah intervening, where she couldn't conceive, and she miraculously uh, was uh, allowed then to conceive a child. All right, so the Judaizers taught that you were e you either had to be a Jew, Jew or you had to act like a Jew in order to be saved. So that meant being circumcised and keeping the outward trappings of the law of, the, of Moses. And, and this was all a result of, of who their spiritual father was. But now Paul is asking, who is your spiritual mother? The Jews knew that they were descendants, as I said, of Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. But Paul turned their most prized bragging right, all right, it turns it around on them, saying you are actually the descendants of Hagar, because those who take matters into their own hands by seeking to keep the law and thinking that they can earn their salvation by keeping the law are the children of the slave woman instead of the free woman, all right? And then this is when he gets into, now this may be interpreted allegorically, okay? That these women are two covenants. One from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. This is Hagar. Hagar is Mount Sinai and Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Okay, so, as far as interpretation goes, all right? There's a lot of people that will say that this text sanctions the allegorical method of interpretation. Okay, now what that means is that it seeks a deeper spiritual meaning below the shallow surface of the literal meaning. And that method of interpretation views the literal meaning of the text as elementary and then secondary to the spiritual, if you will, okay? Now, those who are um, Im immature... Right. Uh, in, in the deeper things uh, or uninitiated into the deeper things are, 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 are able to grasp, grasp the literal meaning. The primary problem, though, with the allegorical method is that the spiritual interpretation becomes highly subjective and often has little correspondence to the text that's being interpreted. So it's no good is my point. All right. <laughs> Don't do that. The easiest way to sort this out is to start where Paul starts, with two women and two sons. They are literal people who lived uh, in the past and whose stories are told and recorded in the book of Genesis. So what happens next is that Paul looks back at the, this, these historical people and he draws certain conclusions from them. All right? And the Greek word for allegorically here is another and to speak. So the things that are being spoken of have a different meaning from what the words express. So Paul says, the two women, these women are two covenants. So Paul reveals how to interpret it and how to see this. He reveals that the two women in the Genesis account actually represent the two covenants of God. So Hagar and Sarah represent the old and new <clears throat> excuse me, new covenants. And Paul sees a huge difference between Sarah and Hagar. Sarah represents grace. H Hagar represents law. Sarah stands for trusting God alone. And Hagar stands for trying to please God through our own efforts. And the sons born to them represent the way of faith versus the way of works. All right. Isaac is faith. Ishmael is works. So you have real people, right, who stand for or point to or represent certain spiritual truths. And Paul is saying that Sarah is in the, is in the line of faith 
and Hagar is the line of works, and all humanity is either in one line or the other. There is no third line that you can choose. You don't mix them together. Those who follow Hagar are the people who believe that religion and good works with self-effort is enough to gain forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. Those who follow Sarah are the people who have rejected self-effort and, and have chosen to believe what God said, which is faith. Okay, so the, <clears throat> the reference then to Mount Sinai points us back to the giving of the law, all right, when, when the law was given to Moses. The earthly Jerusalem is the Jerusalem of the first century, okay, and that, that was the world headquarters of Judaism with its dependence on the law as means of salvation. But since no one can be saved by keeping the law, the people uh, who live in Jerusalem are enslaved by it. They are trapped by demands they can never meet. So the slave woman, Hagar, produces a slave son, Ishmael, who stands for everyone who is enslaved uh, by law-keeping as means of salvation. All right, slavery comes from slavery, bondage from bondage. So Hagar is identified with Jerusalem and Jewry, all right, the Jews. Sarah is identified with the true church, the new covenant, and the heavenly Jerusalem. <clears throat> so Paul is declaring that earthly Israel, the 12 tribes, is to be regarded as Ishmael because they are in bondage to the law and are not free. The true, the true church of Gentile and Jew, which uh, the, all distinct, distinctions are abolished, is the true Israel to whom the promises made to Abraham apply. All right. Now, the Jews would have been highly offended by this. All right. To know that they were they were uh, the sons of Hagar, but is exactly what Paul has stated here. Right. So, yes, physically they descended from Sarah. But spiritually, apart from faith in Christ, they descended from Hagar. The true sons of Sarah, like Isaac, are children of promise. So Paul's saying that as much as you might think that Jerusalem is free, it's only an illusion. All right? And to think that the law can save, that's an illusion as well. By contrast, Sarah stands for the promise of God that's found in the gospel which reveals to us the good news that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. The salvation he offers is, is free to anyone who will take it by faith alone. And the salvation offers true and lasting freedom. Therefore, the free woman produces a free child and because freedom comes from freedom. Verse 26, But, but the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. All right. So you must keep in mind that the comparison here is between two covenants. Earthly Jerusalem represents the old covenant. So this heavenly Jerusalem represents the new covenant. All right. Now the Hebrew or the, the writer of Hebrews points this out when he makes a comparison of Mount Zion and the heavenly Jerusalem in Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So, uh, Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, the church. All right. In verse 28, the kingdom, they all uh, refer to those redeemed in the body of Christ. This is new covenant believers. All right. In verse 20. Um, yeah, I, I think I said 28. I uh, messed up there. Uh, anyway, it's OK. But that's why this verse in Galatians concludes that Sarah who represents the covenant that corresponds to the kingdom of God is the mother, the spiritual mother of all believers. And, and God uh, said of Sarah that she would be the mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. 
which I mentioned earlier. So Sarah equals Isaac, who equals the new covenant, which equals Jerusalem above, which equals the church. Verse 27, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Okay, so Paul cites Isaiah 54, 1 here to establish the relationship of Sarah to the heavenly Jerusalem. All right. Now, this prophecy assures Israel during her barren time of the Babylonian captivity that she will one day have more children than ever before. Now, the Jews took it as uh, this prophecy, not only of the restoration of Israel, but also of the time when multitudes of Gentiles would turn to God and claim Israel as their mother by becoming full members of the Jewish nation. But Paul sees the fulfillment of the prophecy in the birth and growth of the church. So Paul applies the text from Isaiah to Sarah and Hagar as follows. That Sarah at first had no child, but when the promise of Isaac was fulfilled, her posterity exceeded that of Hagar. But in the instance of the spiritual fulfillment of this, the numberless sons of Sarah in the church of the living or in the church of the living God, is even more over, overwhelmingly outnumbered those of Hagar. Verse 28, Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. So you, brothers, right? You, brothers, are believers. Believers are children of promise, not of works. He says it twice. <laughs> He'll say it in 31. It's those who believe in Jesus are descendants of Abraham through Isaac. We are, we, we are not the sons of Ishmael. We have believed God's promise by faith. And on that basis alone, we are God's children. And God declares here that every believer is a child of promise as Isaac was. And that's because like Isaac, we became children of God, not as a result of any action that we have taken. John 1, 12 through 13 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And there you go. Verse 29 of, of Galatians, back to that. But just as, uh, but just as at the, that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. Okay, so after the Spirit, that phrase is synonymous with according to the promise in the previous verse. It stands opposed to the phrase after the flesh. And it means that his birth was by that miraculous agency of God, right? That it was a miracle. Paul says that... Uh, says as at that time referring to Ishmael's persecution of Isaac then he says so it, it's, it's now also referring to the Jewish persecution of Christians in the first century so just as Abraham had two sons that existed side by side these two sons um, are typical of the two Israels of God one born after the flesh which is the old covenant and the other born after the Spirit, which is the New Covenant, and they existed for a time side by side as well for 40 years in the first century. And during this time of coexistence, the, the one born after the flesh persecuted the one born of the Spirit. And now God's solution for this persecution is verse 30. But what does Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So Paul touches here upon the, the, the persecuting envy of the Jews against the church to whom their privileges have passed and likens it to the hatred of Ishmael against Isaac 
and then concludes his argument by quoting against the Jew that the very words originally spoken against Hagar and her son cast out the slave woman with her son. So this refers to the Old Covenant and the earthly Israel, which was the physical Jerusalem at that time. So the abolition of the Old Covenant means the, the abolition of physical Israel from all her privileges and the emergence of the New Testament church is the rise of the Israel of God, which was comp uh, comprised of Jew and Gentile, all distinctions thrown out the door, to whom alone the Abrahamic pro uh, promises belong. So while Ishmael and Isaac coexisted, neither received the inheritance. And in order for Isaac to receive full inheritance, it was necessary to cast out Ishmael. So Paul saying that earthly Jerusalem will never share in the promises made to Isaac. It was, it was not for them, and it never was. They are not the Israel of God, and, and were always the children of the bondwoman. Okay, so verse 31. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So this, he writes to the, mo the most Gentile of all churches, showing that to the Gentile uh, church has passed the covenant, the glory, the birthright, the privilege, and the redemp redemption hope. The consequences of, of this statement are far reaching. All right. They extend to every prophecy of the old Testament in which the new covenant is foretold, even through the words of the prophets. Um, words of the prophets are addressed to Israel and Judah. All right. That Israel and Judah is the new Testament church. The church is the lawful continue uh, continuation of old Testament Israel and the inheritor of, of the Abrahamic covenant and promises. All right. So the freedom, slavery and spirit flesh contrast, which Paul has constructed in, in this allegory serve as the framework for his ethical instructions in the rest of this letter. All right. The children of the free woman who were, uh, born, uh, born, by the power of the Spirit, must learn to express their freedom by walking in the Spirit. They must not submit to slavery under the law or gratify the desires of the flesh, because identity is the basis of, of behavior, and a clear understanding of who you are in Christ guides your conduct in the Spirit.